And Lord, I just pray that you would release their tongue right now in Jesus' name. Now, I don't want you to overthink it. Just be, don't speak in English. Don't think English. Just as you feel it bubbling up, begin to speak. God is giving you it. God is releasing on you. We pray right now. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Rombo shandi arabasa, kino robo bo shambandi aramasata, yambandi aramaso, rombo bo shata rabasa. We pray right now the fire and the power of the Holy Ghost. Be full of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. What is the gift of tongues? How does it work? And is the modern day use of tongues the same gift we see described in the Bible? On this installment of Filtered, where we filter everything through the Word of God, I'm going to walk you through a biblical definition of tongues, and then we'll take a look at the history of today's modern tongues movement. And then to close, I want to offer a word about Pentecostals. I think this particular installment of Filtered is going to encourage you, challenge you, hopefully teach you, but also, and maybe most challenging of all, prove to you that the modern tongues movement is built on very shaky ground. Let's jump in to this next installment of Filtered. First, I wanna start with number one, a definition of tongues. This is how the Bible would define tongues based on what we see in scripture. It is the God-given supernatural ability to speak in a foreign language or foreign languages, plural, that you've never learned before. This gift was effective in the early church, especially for exalting God in Acts 10, 46, for prophesying or revealing mysteries, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, for edifying the church through interpretation, of course, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 4 to 5, and for spreading the gospel to people groups who have never heard the gospel before by evangelists who needed to be able to speak that local language or the dialect of those people, just like we see in the day of Pentecost. Tongues was also a sign to unbelieving Jews. And that is clear in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 21 and 22. Furthermore, tongues as a known human language is quite obvious in the book of Acts as Luke records the various native languages that were being spoken at that time. Listen to this. When they heard this sound, this is the day of Pentecost, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? And then there's this list that Luke gives, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring what? The wonders of God in our own tongues. That's Acts chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. So over a dozen different languages and dialects were spoken in and heard at Pentecost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through chapter 14, the gift of tongues is explained by Paul, along with certain rules for using it, because the Corinthians were out of control. So if we're going to define tongues, we also need to understand the definition or application of its use. Based on what Paul teaches to the Corinthians, tongues in a worship gathering are to be used in order. And there can only be, and I quote, two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret... Let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. That's 1 Corinthians 14, verses 27 and 28. Some people use uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 as an argument for tongues not only being known languages like Pentecost, but also for being ecstatic utterance like many charismatics practice today. Uh, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, for the person who speaks in another tongue is not speaking to people, but to God. Since no one understands him, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. But as part of defining the biblical use or biblical gift of tongues, I want to help us think critically about private prayer languages and really ecstatic utterance. The arguments for this from 1 Corinthians 14 too, are not very convincing, at least to me personally. I know other people make arguments in different ways and perhaps they're more convinced, but mysteries in 1 Corinthians 14 too, can simply be defined as that which was never known before, a lot like prophesying. 
Some people will use their experiences or their idea of what mysteries might be to argue for tongues as ecstatic utterance. And to be fully honest with you, I used to do the same thing when I spoke in tongues and I believed it was a repetitious ecstatic phrase. I would say it over and over. I will spare you the pain of hearing me do it right now. But for people at my church or my small group or in other illustrations, I've actually spoken in my old tongues, simply just repeating this babbling gibberish that I used to do at the altar, and I would repeat it over and over and over. I could even imitate for you different friends or family members and their particular sentence or their gibberish that they use. The idea being, how is it that it's biblical to rattle off the same phrase again and again and again that we just made up when so much of Scripture points to tongues being known, real, interpretable languages. It's important to acknowledge that everybody's experience can be subjective. We can't exegete everyone's experience, but Scripture can give us objective clarity. There are several key reasons that the tongues at Pentecost and the tongues in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 are referred to as known languages. They are known languages. They're not ecstatic utterances, besides the fact that Pentecost lists actual languages and dialects being spoken. A lot of people will say, well, Pentecost was known languages, but the tongues that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, that's a little different. Well, let's think about this. First, Paul never disconnects the gift of tongues from interpretation. 1 Corinthians 12, 10, 14, 26, and 28, all of it. Tongues have to be interpreted. You can't just babble in gibberish, and I'm not trying to be cheeky. You can't and not have actual interpretation of that language, and it's supposed to be a language. So even if someone were to say, well, I'm speaking in ecstatic utterances to God, those tongues would have to be interpreted into clear, intelligible messages in line with the purpose of the gift. Second, when Paul describes the gift of tongues as, quote, kinds of tongues and varieties of tongues in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. He uses the Greek word that refers to family or offspring or race, nation, kind, sort, or class. Dr. Robert Gramacki, distinguished professor emeritus of Bible and Greek, he taught at Cedarville University for more than 40 years, explains this scholarly point in such a simple way. He says this word always depicts things that are related to each other. For example, there are many, quote, kinds of fish, but they're all fish, Matthew 13, 47. There are many, quote, kinds of demons, but they are still demons, Matthew 17, 21. There are many, quote, kinds of languages and tongues in the world, but they're all known languages. Paul could not have possibly combined known foreign languages with unknown ecstatic utterances under the same classification. They are simply not related. In summary, The gift of tongues was for the purpose of communicating truth from God. That's prophesying. Communicating truth about God. We can say that's praising. Communicating the gospel. That is proclaiming. And as a sign to the Jews, and I love to call that proving. Regardless of your position on whether or not tongues are still active today, we all together in unity must accept, at least I believe that we must, certain truths that scripture declares. I would encourage you, do not ignore the definition of tongues, but also the purpose of tongues that we see in scripture. Let me break down a few more things for you, and then we'll jump into the modern history of the tongues movement. First, tongues had a specific purpose in the scriptures and is never required for salvation. I make this point because there are those who teach that you have to speak in tongues to prove that you're filled with the Holy Spirit or you've had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is 100% false to teach that. Everyone gets baptized by and in the Holy Spirit when they get converted. When you place faith in Christ, you don't get the JV, junior varsity, kind of second-rate version of the Holy Spirit, and you've got to level up to get the full version of the Holy Spirit once you get baptized and speak in tongues. Nowhere does Scripture teach this. Scripture teaches also that not everyone has to speak in tongues. So you can't say, oh, you've got to speak in tongues, brother or sister, in order to really experience the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30, this is a passage that totally set me free from this bondage years ago. 
Paul says, not all speak in tongues. So we need to lay off and lighten up with the mandate to do this. Second, there must be order in our services. The mass crowds in charismatic services and churches who speak in tongues through ecstatic utterance have to submit to 1 Corinthians 14, verses 27 and 28. They have to, we do, cease from abusing what is claimed to be the gift. Only two or three may speak, only in turn, and only with interpretation. Realistically, that will eliminate so much of the modern day use of supposed tongues. Anything outside of Paul's mandates for the use of tongues, especially in a church service, is total disobedience to God's word. So if you see a claim that some meeting is revival and you see mass use of babbling in tongues with no interpretation, how is it that God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh, but all that flesh is doing is disobeying him en masse? Even if you believe that your ecstatic utterance is a private prayer language, you can't do that in a large assembly. That's not Costi's words. That's God's words. Third, unfruitful use of tongues should be stopped. If tongues are uninterpreted, or merely a private prayer language without interpretation, and they're engaging the mind as some claim, this is unfruitful. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 14 cannot be divorced from the standard set by Paul. He writes this formula, and his words are very self-explanatory. Listen to this. Therefore, let the one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with my mind also. I will sing with the Spirit and sing with my mind. Otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks, since he doesn't even know what you're saying? For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. I thank God, this is Paul's big point, that I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church... I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. That's 1 Corinthians 14 verses 13 to 19. Think about what Paul says there. I'd rather speak five words with my mind. That means he's speaking in clear, intelligible languages, not a tongue. The Corinthians are told to sing and pray with clarity, with the mind. And even Paul says, I'd rather speak less words that make sense, that's with the mind, than 10,000 words in a tongue. Paul's entire point is about clarity in practice and in purpose. Now, tongues is certainly a very sensitive and personal subject for people, but we all do well to surrender even our strongest opinions to Scripture. Define and use the gift of tongues according to Scripture and that will have major implications for those of you who continue to insist that you can speak in tongues today. Now, I want to dig deep into history here with a history of tongues. We always begin with scripture and definitions from scripture, and then and only then we can find it helpful to walk through church history. I'm not one of those guys that likes to use church history alone for my arguments. I prefer not to just say, well, tradition states. But after going to Scripture, it's helpful to look at the giants in the faith, to assess the shoulders that we're all standing upon, and to see what those who went before us believed and taught. If church history shows us anything about tongues, it shows us that even in the first 300 years of the church, tongues was seen as real, known foreign languages that people spoke fluently and supernaturally, having never learned it before. Gregory of Nazianzus, who lived circa 329 to 390, says this, and I quote, They spoke with foreign tongues, and not those of their native land, and the wonder was great a language spoken by those who had not learned it. John Chrysostom lived about 344 to 407 AD. He's commenting on 1 Corinthians 14 verses 1 and 2, and this is what he says. And as in the time of the building the tower, he's talking about the Tower of Babel, 
the one tongue was divided into many tongues. So then the many tongues frequently met in one man. And the gift was called the gift of tongues because he could all at once speak diverse languages. In modern times, Dr. Wayne Grudem, who's a faithful exegete and who would differ from my position on this, he's a scholar at Phoenix Seminary, still has the integrity to say this about word usage and tongues in the New Testament. Dr. Wayne Grudem, who I deeply respect, says this, it should be said at the outset that the Greek word glossa translated tongue is not used only to mean the physical tongue in a person's mouth, but also to mean language. In the New Testament passages where speaking in tongues is discussed, the meaning languages is certainly in view. It is unfortunate, therefore, that English translations have continued to use the phrase speaking in tongues, which is an expression not otherwise used in ordinary English, and which gives the impression of a strange experience, something completely foreign to ordinary human life. I take that to mean that Dr. Grudem is saying these are languages. It's not just speaking in tongues and some ecstatic thing, but known languages. It would be supernatural and extraordinary for someone to be able to speak a language they never learned before, but entirely human and, might I say, ordinary, that they're speaking an actual language that people can interpret and understand. One of the most remarkable facts from church history comes from the life and the disciples of the modern father of Pentecostalism, Charles Parham. He's actually a legend in modern Pentecostalism. He's the one who influenced William Seymour before the Azusa Street Revival. And what is it that even Parham, that the grandfather, if you will, of the apostolic faith he's called, the modern father of all of Pentecostalism. What did he teach and believe about tongues? In this particular regard, in relation to languages, he explained that real known languages would come upon people. And this would help missions, which something Pentecostals, to their credit, are still very fond of today. Here's what Charles Parham himself says in the Hawaiian Gazette from May 31st, 1901. If they are worthy and seek it in faith, believing they will thus be made able to talk to the people whom they choose to work among in their own language, which will, of course, be an inestimable advantage. He's talking about people who want to go to the mission field if they're worthy and seek it by faith, believing they're going to speak in the known language of the people they go to. And one of the most eye-opening truths about the history of modern tongues and its connection to Charles Parham comes from a woman named Agnes Osmond. My friend, Dr. Nathan Buznitz, is a brilliant church historian. He's sharper than anyone on this topic. And he was recently explaining the origin of modern tongues. And he's written extensively on this topic. He unveils the origins of modern tongues and ecstatic utterance, saying this. On New Year's Day, January 1st, 1901, one of Parham's students, Agnes Osmond, began uttering random syllables. Those who heard her concluded she was speaking Chinese though none of them knew any Chinese dialect. For the rest of the day, she seemed unable to speak in English, and she wrote with a kind of stylized scribbling that Parham and his disciples judged to be Chinese. The students were convinced their prayers had been answered and that what they were witnessing was the very same miraculous phenomenon described in Acts chapter 2. Within days, however, a sample of Miss Osmond's writing was published in a newspaper. It provides objective proof that Parham's claims were totally false. It is a scrap of paper covered with crude, indecipherable, artificial hieroglyphs that clearly have nothing in common with Chinese characters. In fact, like the random syllables she spoke, Miss Osmond's writing has none of the characteristics of any language at all. Dr. Busnitz shared with many of us who were listening to him teach the actual photo of Agnes Osmond's supposed Chinese tongues written out. You can actually find this on Google. It was published in a newspaper, and here it is. I'm not being rude, and I'm not trying to be sarcastically inappropriate. 
But can we not agree that what you're looking at right now looks like nothing more than what your two or three-year-old scribbles on a piece of printer paper when you give it to them and say, write mommy or daddy a card or draw me a picture. Parham, nevertheless, insisted that Miss Osman had spoken and written in Chinese. In fact, Parham himself, at least 30 other students as well, now claimed they too had received the gift of tongues. And in the face of careful scrutiny and hard questions, Parham defiantly enlarged his original fiction. Busnitz is quoting what he says here. He announced that the students had spoken many languages. He himself had received the capability of preaching in German and Swedish, Agnes Osman in Chinese, and others in a variety of languages, including, Parham claims, Japanese, Hungarian, Syrian, Hindi, and Spanish. On and on it goes. Parham advertised that they were getting tongues. Many people jumped on the train with him. And Agnes Osmond's scribbles continued to spread like wildfire as people with no discernment and ability to understand or see what real Chinese was jumped on board and the hysteria exploded. Parham's disciples spanned the globe, taking the supposed gift of tongues to the world. No one questioned it. And if they did, they would be labeled little more than a stumbling block or a spirit quencher, just like people claim today. Busnitz goes on to explain, in the next decade, several teams of missionaries under Parham's influence went overseas expecting to be able to preach and converse in languages they had never studied. The failure of the Pentecostal missionary strategy was immediate and spectacular. In a 1909 report that was released, we can read, Missionary S.C. Todd of the Bible Missionary Society has made investigations personally in three mission fields and among four groups of well-meaning but deluded people who have gone from this country to Japan, to China, and to India, expecting to preach to the natives of those countries in their own tongue. But in no single instance have they been able to do so. They have needed an interpreter in even the most commonest affairs of life, some of them are in absolute destitution and are dependent on their Christian brethren there for the necessities of life and are as helpless as babes. In some cases, they are in danger of losing all faith in the supernatural, in religion, and drifting into infidelity and sin. When we consider the biblical definition of tongues and the history of tongues, we really should be asking big questions about the modern use of of tongues. You may say, Costi, what does Parham's life or Agnes Osmond's claims or even William Seymour in the Azusa Street Revival have anything to do with my sacred belief and use of tongues? Well, they are who Pentecostals and Charismatics build upon. They are the generals of the Pentecostal faith. If you were to try to claim you have some gift of tongues or the ability to speak in tongues, you would have to then either accept Parham, Seymour, Agnes Osmond, and a host of others and their foundational use of tongues, which the modern day use of tongues has come from, or outright reject everything that they claimed and say you have some new version or new definition. And while their tongues were found to be false, yours are real. I think the burden of proof is on the tongue talkers to prove that what they're doing is found in Scripture and linked to the definition of tongues in Scripture. To you modern-day tongue talkers, well-intentioned or not, I want to encourage you to think deeply and critically about your use of tongues. Does it match Scripture? Is it something you picked up along the way? And like some of us, you got coached or coaxed into doing it. There's no shame in taking a second look at this and to ensure that you're in line with Scripture. Your historic generals of the faith are not on par with the true apostles. It's okay to say they got this one wrong. Your foundation could very well be faulty in this area of theology, but perhaps there's other areas where you're strong. It's not shameful to reconsider your use of tongues. It's actually honorable. We all have blind spots, and we all need the Holy Spirit's help to see them. I believe that you, if you're a modern day tongue talker, can be sharpened in this area if you will open up your heart and mind, not to experience, not to speculation, 
not even to the tradition of your Pentecostal heritage, but to the authority of scripture and sound exegesis. In the end, I believe there are genuinely no great exegetical arguments for speaking in the gibberish that we hear today. There are explanations and arguments in which good men, godly men, educated men try to justify what we hear today, but I, for one, don't find them convincing. Third and finally, a word about Pentecostals. This isn't to Pentecostals, but to the more reformed types like me. I believe that when we come to this subject, one of the things we forget is that many Pentecostals and Charismatics are genuine believers and brothers and sisters in Christ if they believe and preach the true gospel, adding nothing to it and subtracting nothing from it. They can be admired for their passion, their evangelistic zeal, their desire to experience God. And look, I've experienced this. Some of them are the most loving people you'll ever meet. At the same time, we need to be discerning, honest, and forthright about the way that emotionalism and experience-driven church and bad exegesis lead to many problems. We need to be honest with our Pentecostal and charismatic friends, neighbors, and family members. We need to appeal to them from Scripture but also build bridges of communication so we can continue the dialogue, not going cage stage on everyone. Otherwise, they're not going to call you when they have big questions because they'll be scared that you're going to unload on them. I also am thankful that more Pentecostals and Charismatics, perhaps than ever, have stopped teaching that tongues is essential for salvation or even essential for the Christian life. I'm thankful that many have stopped teaching that speaking in tongues is useful because the devil can't understand what you're saying or that you can get tongues by babbling at the altar or if someone lays their hands on you. But still, there are many who teach and practice all of what I've just described, and that grieves the Holy Spirit who sovereignly gives the gifts. So, we need to have spirited, loving, biblical discussions. And I hope that we can disagree agreeably with our charismatic friends while still encouraging them to honor Scripture by filtering all experiences through Scripture. Let me give you three book recommendations on this particular topic and the topic of the Holy Spirit. First, I would commend to you the book that I just wrote this past year called Knowing the Spirit. It does cover spiritual gifts it also expands into many other aspects of the Holy Spirit's work, and I think there'll be many things that you agree upon because it's from Scripture, what I'm teaching and explaining, and there might be areas that challenge or sharpen you if you're from Pentecostal or Charismatic traditions. Another book, Spiritual Gifts by scholar Dr. Thomas Schreiner. The best book I've ever read on spiritual gifts, hands down. His tone and approach regarding Pentecostals is admirable, it's humble, it's irenic, He's a dear friend of Dr. Wayne Grudem, Dr. Sam Storms, and many others, and yet he maintains and really models respectful disagreement with them. Lastly, and this one I know might trigger some of you, but Strange Fire by John MacArthur. It's another one. It ramps things up quite a bit, and while it's going to bother some charismatics, let it challenge you. This goes for all of us. If we can't face the strongest words and indictments by those we disagree with, are we really as mature as we think we are? It takes a mature, spirit-filled, Christ-centered Christian to say, I just want to do what the Bible says. I just want to believe what the Bible says I ought to believe, and I just want to do what the Bible tells me. I, I don't care if it's from someone named John MacArthur or someone named whoever. I want to know what Scripture would call me to do. I hope this episode has been sharpening. I hope this episode has been enlightening. And be sure to share it and encourage others if you think it could help them too. Let's keep filtering everything through God's Word. 